real quick right now. I just want to make sure that you have a chance to uh, hear a couple of things about some general pharmacology overview. Um, there's some misconceptions that I wanted to make sure that uh, we got through and figured out so that, uh, that you're not confused as to when and how you can uh, apply pharmacological or medicine interventions. So I'm going to move through the objectives because the big piece I want to talk about is coming up here. Um, we will cover the IV therapy uh, later in the session. We're going to do some ALS assist day and then we'll have some of that there. So we're going to skip that part today. So some of the things that you can administer and this is going to go back to, I'm going to back that up, right now um, the national standards uh, may or may not include the aspirin so I'm going to include it um, because it is an accepted scope of practice. All of the medications I'm going to talk about can be delivered by you as the EMT if in your clinical judgment they fall within the indications or con and don't have any of the contra indications. An indication is something that means it they have a condition that would be beneficial from using this particular medicine. The <clears throat> contraindication is they have a condition or some variable that would prohibit you from doing that, so it's a danger to give it. You need to have medical direction to give these, but remember back from the original we, uh, part of the session we talked about what medical direction types there are. And that does not necessarily mean you have to call for permission with online medical direction. You may be able to do it through offline or through your guidelines or protocols or whatever you want to call them. So you're able to do those medicines. <clears throat> All of these, if your medical director has approved them, can be administered by you. They do not necessarily have to be prescribed for the patient uh, and you can assist with them. All of these you should be able to do on your own with medical direction. All right, so here's the medications you can do. Aspirin, and let me just talk a little bit about aspirin and how it works. Look backing it up here a little bit. Aspirin <clears throat> is used not for pain control, which most people would think of it, but in cardiac-related uh, 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 problems, what's happening, generally, let's talk about a heart attack, so myocardial infarction, a clot forms in one of the coronary arteries, so the artery that feeds the heart muscle itself. How clots form is, is the little red blood cells of the platelets and all that stuff are floating around in there. The platelets end up having little Velcros on them. They're chemical Velcros, but essentially they have Velcros so that when they pass by each other, if they want to form a clot, those little Velcros pop out and they start to grab onto each other. What aspirin does is goes in and clogs up those Velcros. So if you've ever had Velcro that either the, the loop part of it is so worn out it won't grab anything or worse, more common is, is the hook side of the Velcro gets filled up with a bunch of gunk and muck and, and debris so that it doesn't grab on efficiently. That's kind of what aspirin does. People call it a blood thinner. It does thin the blood in that it keeps it from clotting or helps prevent clots from happening. So if the clot's already forming, the aspirin won't probably break it up, but it will keep it from getting any bigger. And if it can do that, then we can stop the progression of the heart attack, and the body's own defense mechanism might be able to turn that around. Later on, they can go in and break that clot up with an angiogram or certain other medica medications. But that's why we give aspirin in coronary, so suspected chest pain from heart reasons. The contraindications are some of the other reasons not to is if they have a bleeding disorder, if you think they're bleeding someplace else, if they're having a stroke. And again, a stroke and a heart attack are almost the same. So if they have a clot in their brain, wouldn't we want to break that up? Well, that's only about three quarters of strokes. The other quarter of them are from either an aneurysm or a bleed or something else. Now imagine if somebody was bleeding in their brain a little bit and causing stroke-like symptoms. Then we gave them this medicine while the body's trying to plug that hole with a clot and we make it so it can't. It would make that bleed even worse, it would be catastrophic and probably fatal. So again, all of these are important things to consider and that medicines that we give are not benign. They do have some serious implications if, uh, if we don't take care of or do them right. Uh, one of the other medicines that you're able to do is going to be the oral glucose. Um, and this comes in 5, 15, and 25 grams of glucose. It might come under some serious brand names or whatever. This is generally given 
if you have a suspected hypoglycemic patient. When we talk diabetics in a little bit uh, down the road, you'll get we can get back into that. But you guys remember your pathophysiology that glucose and oxygen through the mitochondria create ATP. Well, if somebody doesn't have enough glucose in their system, and then they need this to be able to get in there. So, um, key pieces to this are there aren't a lot of contraindications except for they have to be able to maintain their own airway because this is an oral product this is something that they can actually um, they have to ingest there's a little bit that can be absorbed through the cheeks there are certain systems that allow for it to be put on like a tongue depressor and put into the side of the cheek and hopefully absorbed through the soft tissues of the mouth um, I haven't found that to be terribly effective <clears throat> excuse me but it can be done but the biggest thing here is is that they have to be able to maintain their own airway so if you have somebody who's unconscious that we think is diabetic and we go squirt, squirting this in there it's a jelly basically it's a kind of candy goo and we run into airway issues so <clears throat> keeping that in mind don't forget oxygen is a medication and there are consequences for it everything from again we talked about hypoxic drive and pretend, potentially although exceptionally rare shutting down their ability to breathe there's the new stuff that's coming out now where there's a lot more research talking about keeping sats at the upper 90s but not over saturating them because too much oxygen actually we're finding might become an issue as well with uh, free radical production and having too much oxygen causing basically tissue damage again uh, on the inside down at a chemical or excuse me molecular level <clears throat> but don't forget oxygen is a medication Activated charcoal, while it's in the standards, um, I don't know any place that's using it. Um, and if you did, it would be on the order of, or you would need either physician. This is usually one that you're fairly certain um, <clears throat> they've, they've ingested something. Problem with this is um, it tastes like crap. It doesn't get in really well. Um, people don't like to drink it. And uh, <clears throat> But for those that are using it, um, it, how it works is basically for an ingested poison it goes into the stomach and whatever's in there it binds to this is activated charcoal and it, it attaches to the poison um, and then doesn't allow it then to be absorbed into the body and just gets passed out in the poop so um, activated charcoals for ingested poisons um, again things to consider with this at the very least are is if you get them to drink it even though it says it's cherry flavored well it's cherry flavored charcoal and it may cause nausea and vomiting and then we have airway issues um, so uh, whatever your local guidelines suggest but in this case um, I'm not sure of anybody using it locally uh, but if you uh, your system does they'll be clear on that um, there are inhalers and they are used generally uh, people themselves have prescribed ones and then the certain services are allowed to carry them um, so you'll either have a, a nebulizer or a metered dose inhaler. And this is for folks with chronic asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, COPD patients may be prescribed their own at home. But for you, um, on the ambulance, you may have them as part of your kit. And in Minnesota, that's one of the ones that's allowed for uh, to be carried by an EMT service if the medical director approves. So having a bronchodilator or a beta agonist something that will actually get the beta system working again, getting those uh, bronchioles dilated, uh, getting the smooth muscle to open up to let more air down into the alveoli. So that's how it ends up working. Um, the metered dose inhaler, um, generally you shake it up, they take start, they exhale, take a breath in, you squeeze it, it, they inhale it down, they hold it, usually it's two puffs. I'm not exactly sure of the dose on that, I'll have to look it back up again, it's about two and a half milligrams. Then there's the nebulizer where you put it into um, a, a nebulizing chamber where you flow oxygen through it, it vaporizes it, puts it either into a long tube and a mouthpiece or a mask. The patient then inhales that and uh, um, gets the medicine down in there. And again, that would be the common, most common bronchodilator that's out is uh, uh, albuterol. Uh, is the generic name for it um, but <clears throat> uh, it can come under different names like Madeline uh, something else there are some other ones uh, Zopinex is one 
has fewer of the alpha effects than than uh, uh, what do you call it? The albuterol it has fewer of the alpha effects that uh, albuterol has. What I'm showing you in this picture here, real quick, was is that where a non rebreather goes on a neb mask, that bag would be replaced with a nebulizing chamber. And uh, we'll show you those when we get into class some more uh, and play a little bit. But that's uh, how the neb thing works. So, all right, here we go. So we're now to the inhaler. We already talked about that. Now remember, it's a beta agonist. So in addition to opening up the, the bronchioles and the, the respiratory tract, it's going to clamp down a little bit on the periphery and speed up the heart rate. So it may pay, patient may feel a little jittery. This is another one of those ones you want to use in... Uh, a good clinical judgment with. So we're doing a, an assessment on the patient. We have a respiratory patient that we think is short of breath and having a hard time breathing. We start listening and we hear crackles and gunk that sound a lot like fluid in the lungs. They're des describing some generalized chest discomfort and uh, they're having a breathing problem. That would seem to lean me more towards thinking of pulmonary edema secondary to a heart problem. At the very least, it might be a pneumonia, but something with fluid in the lungs. This isn't going to help with fluid. This, if it's a heart, now let's take that example, that is heart-related, the heart's failing, can't clear uh, blood out of the left ventricle, so it backs up into the lungs. We now give, incorrectly, we give a bronchodilator or a beta agonist, kick up the heart rate, putting the greater workload on the heart, it's already in trouble. We're going to increase its workload. It will fail even worse, causing a bigger backup. We can actually exacerbate the problem. So keeping in mind that just because this is a respiratory, this is for respiratory symptoms, it's only for part of those respiratory symptoms or certain categories of them. Now this picture is wrong, and I'm just going to show it because I want to make fun of Pearson and the PowerPoint that they do. That is a nebulizer. That thing in the middle there is a, it's called a spacer that allows that metered dose inhaler where they're pushing this button down on the uh, asthma inhaler, his albuterol inhaler, gives it a little bit of time to open up into that uh, uh, spacer before he inhales it. It lets it kind of get all in and spreads out more so you get a little bit more efficient distribution of it down into the lungs. So. Nitroglycerin, um, again, if it's prescribed for the patient, people may have this at home, but on an ambulance as an EMT, if your medical director has approved it, you can use this. We want to use nitroglycerin in cardiac chest pain that we think is a pending cardiac, uh, uh, either myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, but again, in certain cases of this. So, one, what nitroglycerin does is opens up and relaxes blood vessels throughout the body, reducing the workload on the heart. So the heart has to push, up the, the, the pressure the heart has to use to push out into the arteria, arteries, arterial system, lowers. So it doesn't have to push as hard, doesn't have to work as hard. Well, if it's not working as hard, it doesn't use as much oxygen. Therefore, if it's having... A blood clot where it's reducing the amount of oxygen, it makes it better, or at least minimizes the effect. However, by opening up those blood vessels, we also can potentially lower blood pressure. And if we are having a certain kind of heart attack, especially ones that involve the lower part of the heart or the right side of the heart, they're already running into risk of lowering blood pressure. If we take away what little blood pressure they have, we can then put them into a cardiac arrest. So this is another one of those cases where if they have chest pain that appears to be cardiac in nature, so pressure more than sharp pain, all the assessments that we do for a cardiac workup, they're having it, maybe it's radiating to an arm or a leg, they have good solid blood pressures, so that their skin color is good and makes, is, doesn't look pale, cool, clammy. So I believe uh, most of the texts are saying about 100. Some protocols say 90 for a systolic blood pressure. Certain protocols say up to 110. But call it, let's call it a systolic of 100 is kind of your bottom, your lowest level of your top number. So your systolic pressure of 100. If it's that or above, you're probably pretty safe in giving nitroglycerin for cardiac chest pain. 
It also helps dilate some of the coronary vesicles, but that's really not the primary thing that it does. It pr primarily does a systemic relaxation. So when it does that, one of the side effects that you may get is a headache. You may see a lowering blood pressure, hopefully not terribly uh, significant. If you do, you want to reposition them for shock and those other things that now they're hypoperfusing perhaps. Contraindications for this are blood pressures under the number and an erectile or erectile dysfunction uh, medicine, so the Viagra, Levitra, those kinds of drugs within the last day or so. Um, if they're on low dose of these, I would consult the medical direction before giving us just to make sure that they're okay with it because I've not gotten a good answer on that one yet. The problem is, is that those medicines were actually originally meant to be antihypertensive. Well, it turns out it messed with the blood flow, but it just did it in a certain area. So the problem is that those people are already running at a potentially lower blood pressure anyway, and this might may, uh, blend with that medicine. So nitro and Viagra mixed makes a super blood pressure lowering medication, and it's persistent. We may have a very hard time getting that blood pressure back, especially at the EMT level without any way, ability to put fluids back in or anything like that. So um, nitroglycerin, good thing to have. Don't be afraid to use it, but it's for cardiac chest pain with good blood pressures so that we don't think we have uh, any uh, blood pressure issues. The EpiPen, um, many of you are familiar with EpiPens. I've uh, been involved with somebody at a school, perhaps. Maybe you have an allergy or somebody has an allergy. They've been around for quite a while. What epinephrine does is, it, again, it's an alpha beta agonist and it really uh, opens up vessels gets the vasoconstricting down. Problems is when you're having a true anaphylactic reaction, which is a very severe allergic reaction, your oncotic and hydrostatic pressures start to screw up, your uh, blood vessels become leaky, um, you become, it's called anaphylactic shock uh, in some circles, and you become shocky for a number of reasons. You have a hard time breathing, um, the vessels start to constrict. It's basically your immune system running amok. It overproduces histamine, which then causes systemic swelling. This isn't for somebody who gets hives a little bit when they have a detergent issue or that, you know, they got stung by a bee and their arm swells up a little bit, but that's it. This is all over hives, including inside the body, and a lot of times that includes inside the throat and the lungs. This can be an extremely critical life-saving uh, procedure. So again, this one says prescribed auto injectors, but if your service carries them, this is something you do you need to use if you run into somebody with an anaphylactic reaction. The side effects are minimal. If you give it incorrectly, there's a couple risks that go with it. If you put it into a small muscle, so for example, if you accidentally put your thumb over the auto injector needle um, and you inject the epinephrine into your thumb, it's such a powerful vasoconstrictor, you could actually uh, constrict the blood vessels in that small space of your thumb and actually lose your thumb because it kills off the tissue. But in general, um, if it's used for anaphylaxis, there's very little uh, bad side effect that goes with it. Um, it does increase the heart rate and your blood pressure. So again, this isn't something you're going to give to somebody who's having a big old heart attack. This is for an anaphylactic reaction. So if they're having an allergic reaction that's so severe that their breathing is becoming a problem that they can't uh, hold their blood pressures, this needs to be done immediately. No video. So, in general, drugs do have a generic name and then um, oftentimes they have brand names, and there could be a number of brand names uh, for the same generic drug. So, you can have Wall Drill, Benadryl, uh, Costco Drill, all for the brand named drug that was most commonly known as Benadryl, but its generic name is diphenhydramine. And I have no idea what its chemical name is, to be honest with you, but the chemist and how it's truly made up, the chemical molecule that makes it up, has a chemical name. So if somebody tells you they're taking Benadryl and they hand you a medicine bottle that says diphenhydramine on it, it's the same thing. So things like... Uh, uh, I'm trying to think here right off here. Uh, Lexapro is an antidepressant. is called citalopram, or Prozac is fluoxetine. And you, again, you have some different different names for things. So recognizing that, and then um, 
having a way to look those up. And in a second here, I, no, I didn't put the slide in, but I'll give you a, a, a place to go look. This is where your pocket guys are going to come in handy. So um, when you give a medication, so these are medications you are giving. You need to know when you should, so the indications, when you shouldn't, the contraindications, and then the side effects uh, that, that may come in there. And then there's what's called untoward effects. And untoward effects are things that uh, you really didn't expect or didn't want to have to happen. So coming in here, the medication safety and clinical judgment is uh, where this all comes in. You have to be able to do a good assessment. You have to be able to do a good uh, clinical judgment. So just because they're having chest pain, boom, chest pain, everything shut down, so we just give them nitro. Well, that's not always the case because if it's musculoskeletal chest pain or if this is a breathing problem chest pain, um, we're not helping them. We may be hurting them. So you have to be able to come with your clinical diagnosis, work it all up, find out all the pieces of information you needed to have, and then make your decision to, to do it. If you ever get stuck, you can use medical control and do a consultation. But you should be comfortable with, in most circumstances, making a decision on which medicines you need to use. So, again, just reminding you that there's offline in most places I'm working and in most places I know of in Minnesota, um, you do not need to call for orders for hardly anything. It's all very clearly spelled out in your guidelines. If you have an unusual circumstance, you can call for certainly a consultation, and there's a few drugs or a few medications that, um, particularly pediatric ones, where you may need to call and get permission or have a consult before you can administer them. So just going over these five rights, they're in your book, but I'm just going to cover them again. This predominantly comes from nursing, but it's a good thing to kind of run through just a mental checklist before delivering a medication to somebody. And it's the five rights. It's the right patient, right time, right med, right dose, and right route. Are we doing the... Um, do we is does this is this the right patient now in nursing they maybe have four or five six patients a day so they want to make sure that this medication is for this particular patient for us we generally have one patient at a time but the reason the way I translate this out is do I have the right patient is that means do I have the right indications is this the right medicine for this particular symptom and problem so that's where I use this is this the right patient are the clinical indicators there for me to do it is it the right time now again nursing they have prescribed times in our case we do too because like for nitro for example we do every three to five minutes um, and nitro is every five minutes it's happy that's every three so every five minutes or so we want to give nitroglycerin so is it the right time have we done it too soon have we been too long is it the right medication look at the bottle or the dosing you know or at the the delivery device is it really what you think it is um, as you get into working in an ALS truck, you have a lot of medication bottles and they look similar. So you really need to verify that it says this is nitroglycerin. This is not uh, whatever. So is this aspirin? Is this uh, epinephrine? Is this what it is? Is it the right dose? So if it is, you know, are we giving the right amount? And is this the style or a, a, a route that we can give it in? So for EMTs, we basically can do an auto injector, which is a, an IM or at least sub Q IM injection, but it's auto injected. It's about the only injectable you can do. Um, but the rest are going to either be inhaled or oral. You're not going to be allowed to give injections other than those auto injectors. So is it the right route? So. So you've already read through the routes. Have been. I'm just going to go back onto here. Uh, after you give a medication, you need to reassess. So this will be part of your documentation as well. But not in the, not only do you need to write about it, but you really need to do it. What happened after you gave it? Did they get better? Did they get worse? Or did they stay the same? So within a few minutes of giving that, um, you're going to want to make some reassessments, and then clearly document those. Now, patients have their own medications that they take, and there will be a whole host of them. And again, we talked about sample questions. I got into this whole idea of, uh, you know, hey, do you have any medical problems? No, no, no problems at all. Are you taking any medicines? Oh, yeah, and they list off about 10 medications. Well, because the medications are managing their medical problems, they don't think they have any medical problems. Medicines that the patients take can give you a lot of clues as to what their underlying problems are can give you clues to potential risks and if that fits the clinical picture might help you solidify what's going on with this patient today. I know 
a half a dozen dozen of the common medications, but they tell me what something is. So they say they're on hydrochlorothiazide. I know that's a blood pressure medication. If they're on propranolol, I know that's a beta blocker. It's probably for blood pressure. Certain medications you get to know, but until you get to that point, and for all the millions of medicines that are out there that we have no idea or that there's so many different brand names for some of these, having a pocket guide is a very big help. So there's a couple of them, and Informed, I-N-F-O-R, MED is one brand of printed one that I like to use. There's also an Android and iPod or iPad app for them, Infomed, uh, and then the other one is Epocrates. Epocrates is free and has a very large medication database. It basically brings down, you can punch it in, it'll tell you what it's for, while it's broken down. It's a small little def, uh, pharmacolo pharmacology reference. It's very handy, but it's meant for Android or uh, smartphone kind of tablet apps. So I like to have a printed copy too in case you don't, your phone takes a crap or you're not in cell coverage or et cetera, et cetera. Having some of that ability to look up what the patient's meds are gives you clues as to what their underlying problems are and perhaps what the current problem is, either through overdosing, underdosing, or just simply you know that they have a particular problem and this it meets up with your clinical findings so your diagnosis becomes such. So don't forget that there are Holy, uh, holistic medications that people are taking and they do have pharmacological problems. So when you're asking about medicines, asking them, are you taking any natural or over-the-counter you know, over the counter meds, are you taking anything, uh, the holistic type stuff, uh, they can have some issue uh, in, in medical problems or uh, medical pharmacologically um, interactions with other medicines. So. All right, so I'm going to skip through the assisting IV therapy. We're going to go through that uh, later. Um, that is it, and again, I apologize for forgetting to put this up, and uh, we will see you guys Thursday night, which I think is tonight for when I'm recording this, and we'll be doing CPR, and uh, we'll be, mm, that's about it. So we'll bring you through that. If you have any questions, email them to me, and we will talk to you all soon. Good night.